Straddling the divide of Kentucky and Tennessee is the land between the lakes. Once a land between the rivers, a desire for progress would lead to the damming of these ancient waterways, reshaping the land, submerging graveyards, and displacing generations of families who had called this place home for over 200 years. And from this tragic moment, what darkness may be feeding. In the early 1980s, whispers of an unspeakable slaughter began to seep throughout the LBL, an attack by a creature that shouldn't exist. But what if it's real? Join us as we lay out the tale, review new eyewitness testimony, and examine the alleged conspiracy of silence in the arguably darkest of Dogman legends, the beast of the land between the lakes. Conspiracy. Synchronicity. Sasquatch. Homunculus. Alien races. Satanism in Hollywood. MK Ultra. Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close like, the door, in. Jury! In. Close your door! What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman. Bohemian Grove. Felt. Magicians are demons. Specters. And spirit spooks. summonings. Paralysis. Strange disappearances. Sky whale phenomena. Yes. Alternative history. Shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about. That's old. Y2K. Cover-ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hi. Welcome to Beliefful. I'm Jeremy. I'm John. I'm Chris. And we are the brothers of the Beliefful. And we are so happy that you've come to join us today by the fire. We need some company because this is going to be a pretty terrifying episode. Yeah, this is a uh, this has got some darkness in it. This has got some some mystery, some adventure, but definitely some. Uh, is this our third dog man? Probably fourth. Is it fourth? Fifth, maybe. No. Well, we've definitely depends on what you refer to as dog man. Like a dedicated episode to the phenomenon, just on dog man, yeah. and not uh, dog man adjacent, like fear eaters or werewolves. Or, right. This is the third one. This is probably the third like. Heart of the dog man. Deep dive. Right. This is a specific location, though. Sorry. Why don't you explain it? Let me get into it a little bit here. So, oh, oh sorry. I was just going to tell you. This, this is interesting. People should know. If you want to go in and check it out, you can go to our website and search. We're search friendly now. Our first episode was the deep dive on the history of the dog man and across cultures. The sinocephali. And yeah. The, the second one was the dog man encounters, freakish nightmare encounters. We talked about the chair red muffler story. Oh yeah. It was so interesting. Then we Cherry did bomb muffler. Yeah. Then we did in season two. Also we did the uh, dog man and fear eaters windows to other worlds, which was a right. great episode. Anyway. And we also talked about the connection with cemeteries. Yeah. That was another one, I believe around Halloween. And that's going to come up again and today. And that's coming up in this one because there is definitely some connection with cemeteries and um, some interesting nodes of truth, I think in this episode in the lore here. And this is a controversial issue, a controversial legend, yeah. I guess you could say. And we're really going to try to break this down for you guys. We've got some really great clips coming up from other sources, uh, some interviews, alleged firsthand accounts, a deathbed confession coming from the uh, North American Dogman Project, an interview from the Confessionals podcast as well, just to kind of get into the heart of the matter of this. It all begins with an urban legend, or that's the allegation that it's just a legend. That's the reason that I've, I've put off doing this episode for a long time. And we've had people write in because I made mention in a previous episode and said, you know, I've looked into the land between the lakes, the dogman encounter, the attack, the trailer or the tent or whatever it allegedly was where the family was slaughtered. And there just wasn't anything to it. There was no uh, newspaper articles. I searched all the databases that I have connection with, with news archives. It was all word of mouth. Nothing on the internet as far as an official document, all word of mouth, just story. So I was like, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to just tell a story. And then someone wrote in and said, have you seen the confession? The deathbed confession. The deathbed confession of a Kentucky wildlife fish and game fella who allegedly saw an attack that 
affected him so much that he, on his deathbed, he had several months to live with cancer, according to the North American Dogman Project, who interviewed him for this, who I think are respectable guys, Jody and the crew. Yeah. Uh, he died shortly after he remained anonymous, but he felt like he needed to get the story out. I'm looking forward to hearing that one. Yeah, it's pretty compelling. So I, I downloaded and transcribed his specific words and kept it pretty much word for word. And then I read it for that part just because I wanted it to be really clear. Um, and John, so you could elucidate it with your sound design and kind of set the scene. And then there are clips of him where you get to hear his voice specifically. You can hear how affected he is with some of the Q&A from the North American Dogman Project. Yeah, you kept some of that in so that you could kind of get the feel for the guy. Exactly. But anyway, so... Are these beings from hell? That's the question. Some people do believe that. Some people believe that they are immaterial. Some people believe they are somewhat incorporeal. Some people believe they go in and out. Some people believe that they are demonic manifestations. Some of, people think they're strictly biological. You, you always have that sort of faction in these crypto. Could they be all three? I mean, or could they be different? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just like the, the big feet, the big foots. Well, we've covered in the, our Fear Eaters episodes before with Dogman and like the, they always seem to get right up to the point of trauma or the point of fear and not yeah. cause violence. <laughs> What's but the there, word? Isn't there some violence in this one? Exactly. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying when it comes to the differences right. in, in the idea of these things. Yeah, it's true. It's We've talked a lot about, a lot of these stories do seem like they were more interested in the getting right up to that point of terror yeah, and then backing off. And then these ones, for lack of a better term, are pretty horrifically gruesome. Yes. Well, and that was always the argument because we made the state, we, we, I don't think we coined the term fear, I don't think, but no. we, we started organically saying that. Or, I feel like someone else must have said it. It's probably parallel thinking, but we, that was an early episode. But I think to say fear eater and nightmare feeder together is a beliefful original Maybe. for sure. I don't think it was a popular term, though, when we started using it. Fear eater. Yeah. No. I mean, obviously that idea comes from, like, Stephen King, it, Pennywise. That's true, yeah. Right. I don't know if that term was ever used. Regardless. Yeah. We are awesome. Yes, that's We coined true. it totally. <laughs> Trademark. The point is... Uh, TM. The point is, that's... You're right. That, that was kind of... The reason we called our episodes that, we referred to the dog man as that, is because of this kind of tantric attack where it would get so close where it could grab you, elicit the maximum fear, pump that adrenochrome from your pineal gland or your adrenal gland, rather, and absorb that dark energy. Like these are nightmare feeders, mm -hmm. right? Fear eaters. And that's probably when I mentioned the LBL because I said there's been no, that I know of for sure, a physical violent attack where people have been killed. And then that's when someone wrote in and said, you need to check out, L you need to look again at LBL. And that's when I came across. Oh, okay. And I think that the confession was recorded in 2021. The story that I read. Yes. That's different than this. That's, yeah, that's the original, quote, urban legend that some people say is based off, it happened in the 80s, some people say it's based off of a real life double homicide. Well, the, the story that you read, John? Yeah, that you haven't heard yet, audience. Yes, that comes from an alleged secondhand witness named Jan Thompson. And she, she wrote a blog about 2014 around there. We'll get to that later. But basically, this attack that Jeremy's talking about, this violent attack that is legendary now at Land Between the Lakes, happened in the 80s. She was working at a gas station in the 1980s, according to her, mm -hmm. and two regular police officers who would come in a few times a week, came in one night, traumatized, and then they told her this story. And so that's what we're going to... What they saw. What they saw, allegedly. And we'll, we'll talk about her write-up of that and how that's been kind of passed down and the controversy around that and other stories. But let's just set the stage real quick for you guys that are unfamiliar with the land between the lakes area. Now, this is a national park, right? A national recreation area, land between the lakes. It spans from Kentucky to Tennessee. Actually, I've heard from people that it's kind of like their Yellowstone. And this is one of the reasons why. It's 170,000 acres. This big place. It's massive. Here's a clip I'll put in the show notes from the Elk and Bison Prairie National Recreation Area. God, bison are dumb. <laughs> that is not the takeaway I thought you would get from this, job. I'm just kidding. I Beautiful love, animals. They are cool. I was just joking. Bison. I mean, it's, it's a drive through with bison they have there. I mean, it's a massive place. This is just one of the things, but they have buffalo. Just perfect feeding ground. Reminds me of... Uh, yeah, really. It reminds me of Yellowstone. The, just the magic... The majesty, the depth of forested land, the thickness of this place. What would you say? What kind of thickness? Oh, uh, something thick. Oh, graboid thick. Graboid thick. Listen to the expansion to get that reference. <laughs> <laughs> it's graboid thick. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, pretty incredible place. But it wasn't always like this, right, Jerry? No. And this is kind of the, this is almost why we talk about trauma. And if this thing is demonic or feeding on fear and grief and sadness. Parasite. The genesis of Lamb Between the Lakes is kind of heartbreaking. Heartbreaking, this place, because I know initially there was a, was it the, not the Hoover Dam, the Kentucky Dam. Essentially, 
before this became this national park, land between the lakes, a lot of people lived here. And we've heard about this kind of thing happening in the past in different places. We covered Yellowstone, for instance. But before it was land between the lakes, it was the land between the rivers until they dammed it. And when they dammed it, they flooded a ton of land, forcing people out of their homes. You know, it's one of the situations where the government's like, I'm going to give you money, but you have to go. I'm going to buy your home. I don't know what the price was, if it was fair. Nobody knew about us. They didn't know us. They didn't know how we lived. We had a great way of life. We knew everybody. We didn't really know how special we had it. But, you know. I profoundly feel like that I participated in uh, a rape of the people's property. I had that feeling at the time, but at the time, it didn't bother me. What's that called? Eminent domain, yeah. Exactly. And they just decided that they're going to, it's a reclamation area, I believe. They basically claimed the land and kicked everybody out. And to this day, there's uh, another controversy about the connection with the dogman lore and this area because people are essentially offended that anytime you type in Land Between the Lakes, you get Dogman, as opposed to the generations of history that, yeah, the history. I don't think there was a lot out there, to be fair. They're online anyway. Right. Maybe, I'm sure there are books, and there was a lot of passed down generational knowledge. But I get the overriding of the, just the damage that that's done. Anytime you create a place like that and you kick people out. Oh, for sure. Generations that have lived there since the 1700s that no longer, they're forced to leave. Some people arrested because they didn't move in time. Yeah. And then they had to had their house bulldozed and buried and burned. So that kind of trauma, I mean, there's 270 cemeteries in the land between the lakes that have been abandoned because, you, you know, no one can live there anymore. So Many underwater too. Yeah, so people make pilgrimages to their families' cemeteries now, but they, it's not like they can, they no longer live near them. They're not on their land. What was the reason? That's a good question. I know why. Go ahead, Chris. It was Eisenhower. Was that the guy who did the, the big work project in the 40s? No, Roosevelt. So Roosevelt, not Teddy, probably uh, Theodore. Same guy. No, Eleanor. D. Eleanor, or what's his name? Huh? We had two Roosevelt presidents. It wasn't the cool, badass Theodore. It wasn't Teddy. It was the second Roosevelt. Franklin? Franklin. Franklin Delanor. Franklin Delanor. <laughs> Eleanor. <laughs> I got that wrong. Uh, yeah. yeah. He was the big works guy. Let's invest a lot of money. Well, so this is a parks thing? Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. It was part of the New Deal. Roosevelt had... The strange new deal. The strange new deal. <laughs> so they call it. <laughs> it's they a were funny trying name. to, oh, well, you know, if you know your history, you know, getting out of the depression, trying to create jobs, but also there was a problem with energy. Oh, right. In the South, so they were trying to start, you know, civil engineer programs to create power down there. One of the ways to do that was to create dams. So, right. It started with him, and they they made the Kentucky Dam. They dammed up the Kentucky Lake and made right. the dam there, and then they did the other side, finishing the Barkley Dam in the sixties. And basically both times flooded regions of the area, washing away generations of family land and history and cemeteries. So people were forcibly removed. I looked it up. I couldn't, there weren't any cases of violence or anything like that, but there were a lot of people who were in total despair because they didn't think they were getting an, a fair amount yeah. for the money they were being given by the government. And I heard people that died just from, well, I don't want to say from sadness, but like when you lose your home, and especially if you're older... Yeah, you can die from a broken heart. Mm -hmm. I think that it just led to the, a lot of deterioration in a lot of people. You just don't have a reason to be around anymore. Yeah, you have no connection to your history right. and your family. Anyways, all that trauma, all that tragedy, that does tie in a little bit to the argument, as out there as it is, that if there is something that manifests in a place like that, when there's... We've talked about the green eyes, old green eyes. Yeah. In, uh, was it Chattanooga or... Battle of Chickamauga. Yeah, I... Interesting example is this um, gravestone. Yeah, I wondered if there was a cross on that or something, but it broke off. Boats hit this all the time. So this is... A, Boats hit it? Yeah, because they've. this is underwater most of the year. Yeah, and this will be in the show notes for you guys. This is uh, one of those unique oddities of this place. And when you do something like this and you drowned out an area, something called Cemetery Island. Kentucky Lakes Winter Pool Reveal Cemetery Island. So I think it, the water is dropped or goes down about four feet in the winter. And at that time, you can see revealed a piece, at least a piece of the cemetery. And I don't know how many other cemeteries start to rise from the waters or if it's just this one that they call Cemetery Island. But actually, it's the, the Tennessee Valley Authority who's behind the dams, the yeah. construction in the first place. They lower the, intentionally lower the water. But most of the time, you, you can't see these tombstones. They're underwater and boats hit them with their props all the time. That's crazy. Yeah. 
Anyway, so that's just a, a very visual example of how families had to leave and had to leave their loved ones, you know, in these places that just became a drowned massive graveyard in some areas. So yeah, that is the atmosphere. That's the setup. It is a beautiful place. I'd love to go sometime, maybe not at night, but that's, that's where this legend is born from. So let's talk about the legend. Let's talk about the birth of the beast, the story that I think originates from the early 1980s. And this all kind of starts with, well, one example of a witness reporting comes from Jan. Are there like a lot of stories in this area? Well, this is the thing. So in doing the research for this, uh, I wanted to find, because you find all, all over the internet, online, on paranormal blogs and stuff, that they always say that in the Land Between the Lakes area, uh, the, the stories go back to the 1700s with French trappers, early settlers, and natives in the area. But I couldn't find any hard sources of that just from blogs, from paranormal investigators who say that these stories are yeah. out there. But there's nothing... Well, this is kind of the first concrete someone alleged to have seen something that's come forward, I think started in the 80s. And I think, too, that um, having something recorded like that, because I, I, I tried to find this last night. I was up all night. And I really wanted to, to pump this full of information. And I thought I read this in Linda Godfrey's book, Real Wolfman, but it, I think it might have been a much older book. But they talk about, and I believe this was talking about the land between lakes, or at least in Kentucky, Tennessee, in the area, where French trappers did come in and they carried the legend of the Luke Guru. Right. And, and maybe the, the manifestation of this, you know, this, which is like the French werewolf when they came over from France yeah. in that area, it kind of infested there, at least the mythology of it. And it bred maybe the genesis of this concept in the area that just, I don't know, you could say hit a swamp thing, kind of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles mutagen moment when the, when the dams flooded the area and created land between the lakes. I don't know. What? I'm not sure my brain went there. I just meant like <laughs> maybe that original idea of Loop Guru, if it did exist there, became something even more intense oh, right. like and a deadly. Cult cultural... Yeah, or just a, a tul tulpic... No, here we go. With the tulpas. Uh, shift in this, whatever this entity is, whether it is real or manifested or just believed, but it became this deeper, heavier thing after the after the flooding. Right. I think that's kind of an interesting um, direction because I thought of well, it. Well, it definitely know. makes sense with the, with the despair and that stuff we talk about. But that's a good point. We'll get into that towards the end of the yeah. episode with theories because I also want to talk about the graveyard connection and the water boundary connection because obviously water plays a big role here yes um let's get into the legend yes well, i think a good place to start is jan's alleged encounter yeah so let's begin there and this allegedly took place in the 1980s and i think first written down on the electronic internet in 2014 i think this is i believe this is the only on record that i could find accounting of a secondhand witness of the occurrence that it occurred at the time. Until the deathbed confession, which we'll right, get, to, which later, we'll get yeah. to, which may be a different account, but yes. Is this the Jan? This is Jan. Jan it up. After 20 something years of this, I decided to sit here and talk to you to get it out in the open. Cause there are so many people out there, so many witnesses and possibly victims. They need to know that somebody is going to stand up and say, Hey, this thing exists. It lives in these woods. I worked at a nearby 24-hour service station, and there were two local officers that used to come in and get coffee. I knew them by name, and they'd come in three or four times a week. And there was one particular night, actually about 2.30 to 3 o'clock in the morning, when they came in. One of the officers, Adam, actually stayed outside. He sat on the curb of the station, and he was physically getting ill. They were both visibly shaken. They were very pale. And I asked, I said, is there something I can get you? Are you both sick? I thought maybe both of them had the flu or something. Bill started shaking his head and said, I can't believe what we just saw. I can't believe what we've just been through. Bill started speaking very slowly. He said that he had been called in to assist in an investigation at a campsite in the LBL area. The two campers had stumbled across a campsite and that a crime had been committed. When they got there, there were already police lines up. There were cruisers from various counties and there were two corner trucks from different counties. The camping trailer looked like it had been beaten. There were bloody handprints. The campsite was just torn apart. And he then proceeded to talk about the victims, the bodies. 
He said there was a male body found, a female body found, and a little boy's body found, what was left of it. The bodies were ravaged. They were torn in several sections. The father figure had an arm actually ripped from the torso, and it had a clump of hair in its hands that he noticed. They took that out and put it in a bag, and there were several different officers around that were bagging things and tagging things and marking with flag markers. And he said that there were claw marks in the bodies, especially on the man's back. He was describing that, where there was a wide radius of deep scratch marks that went through, just went through the entire back, the flesh. There were bite marks, and there was a coroner there that had been measuring the bite radius, trying to determine what had created all this carnage. And one of the officers came out of the camper and he said, we have a problem. And they said, what? He said that they found a man's clothing, female clothing, a mother's clothing. They found a little boy's clothing and they found some little girl's clothing. So they assumed that they were missing a body. So a search ensued and it was Adam. He felt something dripping on his hat. And so then he looked down and it was dripping on his shirt. And he took his flashlight and he looked up. And his light caught the glimmer of a little leg that was hanging. And they found the little girl. She had been carried, taken up in a tree. And it looked like her back had been broken because they said the body was hanging over the limb. As he was telling me the story, reliving this, I noticed the marks on Adam's hat and his shirt. It hit me that, okay, this is blood. This is blood. It was hard for me to comprehend what they were saying. He continued and he paused several times during this retelling, like he was trying to gain his composure or he was trying to grasp everything that he was seeing. Then he continued and said that there were conversations on could it have been a bear? Could it have been a cougar or a panther? And one of the medical personnel that was present said, no, the bite radius doesn't match. There's no bears in this area and everybody was saying, well, it looks like a bear attack. They couldn't pinpoint what had done this. He mentioned that some government officials came in at the last minute and told everybody that they were taking on the investigation. I remember listening to the local news and getting the paper every day and there was nothing mentioned in the media about anything like this. So they come in a couple of months later and Adam had stayed in the car and Bill had got out and I noticed that their hair had turned mostly white. They had aged 12, 15 years, a lot of stress, a lot of stress. Their faces were gaunt. They weren't talkative anymore. They weren't jolly. They weren't themselves anymore. Three to four months after that, which would make about six months after this incident, Adam came in to get some coffee one night, and he said, you remember that hair that Bill was telling you about that was found in the man's hand? I said, yeah. He said, well, they sent it off. We heard that they couldn't match it to any DNA, but the closest they got was Canis lupus. I'm not saying that the beast of LBL committed this carnage. I'm not saying this really happened, but I will tell you this. Those two gentlemen, their entire personalities, their demeanors, changed overnight. Disturbing. So that comes from Jan mm -hmm. Thompson, right? Yeah. And you can find in the North American Dogman Project documentary, that's where this interview comes from. Yeah. And I think Barton Nunley was actually the one interviewing her. At least she says, um, she mentions, you know, she's after years, she's here and wants to tell her story to Bart. Yeah, and I'll just say Barton Nunley is a major player in the Dogman realm. Yeah. One of my favorite books we've covered is Inhumanoids, so I'm going to leave a link to that in the show notes. And I, yeah, I believe he was involved in this documentary. Seems like a good guy. He's got a YouTube channel. I haven't checked it out too much, but I know he does some, like, if you want to go see someone walking in the land between lakes or other areas in investigation mode. He, yeah, definitely a boots-on-the-ground researcher, for yeah. sure. Anyways, link in the show notes to that and his work. But with Jan, she does seem very sincere. Yeah. In the, in the original clip, which we linked in the show notes. Um, yeah, I will say to that point, and she does seem, and definitely listen to that in her own words, because uh, you can really get a read on people more, obviously, when you hear their, right. their but I did want to say, it was interesting because I went back and I looked at her initial write-up 
was republished on a blog called Demon Hunter's Compendium. And when you read it, it's definitely one of those things where you can see why people could be skeptical. Because when anybody reports an experience they had, and then they get really detailed with like, for example, when she's recounting the police officer's story that he's telling her, it kind of goes into more of like a narrative tone of like, they wave the $50 flashlights across the the glimmering gl- grass, yeah. that kind of thing, where you start to go like, how much is it embellished? Yeah. How much of it is it possible? But when you hear her, it's definitely hard to say like she made it up. So you kind of have to you know, look at all the evidence and weigh what Someone you just left a comment on an older episode we did that said, I, I still don't understand why someone who experienced something unexplainable can also be like a budding author that wants to write well. And or why they, they can or can't. Why? Because I think we were probably criticizing like if it's too flowery, oh, right, like right. It, it leave some credibility. It doesn't mean of, that you're making things up. It yeah. just, but it definitely like, well, you know. I, I, my, my response was essentially like, if it's, usually when something, especially something traumatic or something right. very intense happens and you want to convey the truth of the matter, you really get down to brass tacks and you say it was dark. It depends on how long it's been since, because if you have a long time to reflect on it, maybe you have written it out and you want it to be like detailed. And But but the point is like your intention, if you you really want people to believe it, and not because it's just people's gut instinct, but also if you were, you only have so many words people are going to read would you spend more time on the creative way of describing the scenery that maybe you don't remember? on the person. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think some people may be like, well, if I, if I, really bring it to life with more detail. Yeah. I don't know. I understand what you're saying, but I can see how some people might think, well, I want to write this out really yeah. well. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's this balance of like truth and yeah. elaboration. I mean, especially coming from a skeptic, you know, or someone that does a lot of research. Yeah. Well, also like, do you remember which way the branches swayed that night? You know what I mean? Or, or how that person smelled? If you're adding some details, and this isn't to Jan, I'm just saying like, right. In general, if someone's adding details that like, I would be just right off skeptical that they would remember that or know that or that that happened that way, that if your main intention is to convey that this actually happened to you, yeah. you just wouldn't add a lot of that stuff. That's kind of my point. I'm trying to think about the way I tell the story of the UFO thing, because uh-huh. that was kind of my version yeah. of something. It's like you're recalling it. And the, I feel like it's more to me about the motion of the experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree with John. And I think it's reader response. Like, I think just because someone gets more visual with details. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're uh, fabricating things. It right. could just mean they, they are, and they might just be someone who enjoys writing. So as yeah. long as you're not expanding yeah. the details, I will say with Jan's one thing that I can see why people might think that is because she wasn't at the crime scene. So when she has, you know, some lines that are a little more detailed, like, yeah, it is a lot of detail for just a conversation right. with like with the excited movements of $50 flashlights being held by nervous, restless hands, searching the trees, the ground, the leaves, the shadows. Yeah. It's written really well. She could be just That's elaborating not in on what the, I just, oh, you just had a certain portion. Yeah. What we read was a transcription that we transcribed from the audio interview with Jan. Right. Okay. The quote I just read came from her, her initial published blog, which I think was around 2000 aughts. Recounting what we'll have that link to what the deputies told her. Yeah, make up your own mind. And she obviously like she knows the area. She wrote a good history leading up to this about the area. You could argue what does she have to gain? Right. So I'm not throwing any shade her way, but I just wanted to give the full picture of why some people might be skeptical. I have a question about because anyone tried to find the the cops? Yeah, like the original deputies involved. That was if I had had another day, I would have tried to see if there was because obviously she uses pseudonyms in this. Adam and Bill and Bill. Okay, so it seems like. She heard this account from these officers, and then there was no mention of any of this in the news? Exactly. That it even happened? Well, yeah, the, it's alleged that there was a cover-up. That's the kind of story behind was this. Was the news reporting that, they, that there was a murder there? No. Yes. The, well, this is, the, this is the issue, and this is, this is something I wanted to not touch on. Not at this on. time period. Not, this, not at this... 1980. Yeah, but not during this... I don't think during this experience. Well, that is... That's the argument people make. So there was a... I guess you call it a double homicide, too girls were murdered in the land between lakes or their bodies were discovered there. But not the family. The, the... Not a whole family. So this is when the argument is that this is, look, this is an urban legend that's been pulled from this real event, which often happens. This legend is created, this myth grows from into something more horrific and supernatural, fantastic, when there was an actual murder there. And just to touch on that, because that's an argument people make skeptically about it, which I don't, I don't necessarily agree with just because of the other testimony we have. Right. Just because there's a murder in an area doesn't mean that then there's also nothing else strange that goes on there. Right. Well, let me just touch on that so we can, we can get through that. Cause I think people often, that's what people use to, to poo poo the land between the lakes, the beast of right. land between the lakes. Uh, it was in 1980, September 7th. And that's around the same time when this urban legend began, allegedly when I think Jan even says in the eighties, um, it's a long period of time though. And synchronistically, this is also around the same time that 
This could be considered part of the confusion, or some people would say a cover-up with the deathbed confession we have coming up because it happens around the same time, 1979, October. So the murder, this really tragic, real event, the double murder that still haunts the, the family, friends, and community, took place in 1980, September 17th, in Dover, Tennessee, Stewart County. The victims were 14-year-old Carla Atkins and 16-year-old half-sister Vicki Stout. Witnesses saw someone talking to the girls in a blue pickup truck. That's who they ultimately believed was responsible, but it was a very, very horrific scene. The bodies weren't found till much later. The bodies had been decomposed, uh, shotgun wounds, you know, the whole mess. Just a, just a terrible, awful thing to witness. FBI were involved, and it remains unsolved to this day who actually killed the girls. It's awful. So with all that going on at that time, most people, when they say that this urban legend they just assume, if it came from yeah. somewhere, they, well, of course, they, you can't draw a map to where a legend comes from, but that's what they will argue skeptically. It's like, look, there was a murder. It was horrific. Some, you may have seen police there. The police may have been affected and that morphed into this legend of the land between the lakes. But the problem with that is we have not only Jan's, you know, believe her or not, you have a deathbed confession from a guy who, what does he have to lose when he remains anonymous and gives a deathbed confession? Right, and that's a recent sort of development, That isn't was it? 2021, and that was recorded by the North American Dogman Project. Nice. And we're going to recount his story, and then we're going to hear pieces in his own words from the original audio as well, and link to that in the show notes. And I actually heard this first on the Macabre Podcast, who you guys should check out on YouTube. They do great work. It turns out to be a listener of the show, but that's where I originally found this excerpt from the North American Dogman Project, Land Between the Lakes documentary. Definitely check that out, guys. Yeah. Link in the show notes. Turns out to be a listener of the show, which is extra cool. Right on. And then, of course, we have from Tony Merkel, Confessionals Podcast, did a great interview with a guy named Martin Groves, who was a retired sheriff who had an encounter in 1993. We have a couple pieces from that as well. And that was in that area. Well, yeah, it's exactly the same He was area. a police officer, right? Land Between the Lakes. Um, yeah, he was a retired. He is retired now. I'm not sure if he was retired at the time, but we'll hear that in the clip. Him and his friend under the pseudonym Harry went out and uh, had a pretty ridiculously intense encounter. And that wasn't at the same time? 1993. Okay. No, what they witnessed is not the same event. But to clarify, the deathbed confession from the guy who goes by the name Glenn, for the sake of the, uh, the deposition, what he witnessed was, right around the exact same time, it was October, end of the year, 1979. Not only of the double murder, but where, I believe, Jan's story kind of takes place. So, with all this going on, and he believed there was definitely a cover-up. So we'll hear all of that. I, we'll, we can keep moving. I just want to touch on the things that always come up when you talk about land between the lakes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Last thing I want to say is, um, to the skeptical point, there was also someone who, you know, do take a comment for what a comment is, but I think oh, you, that's coming you up, have it right. coming up, but it's basically someone saying that I think that they said, when someone said, oh, you're conflating it with what you saw with... Right. He's like, no, I remember that thing. This happened yeah. at a different time period when I was going over the bridge and saw all the cruisers and stuff. I found a little piece of testimony that refutes the conflation with that murder and what really happened from allegedly someone who was there at the time and remembers the difference between those two events, the murder and the other scene where the military showed up allegedly at the campground, whichever version you want to believe. Yeah. And as always in the whole, we're going to give you as much information as we can and link it all in the show notes. And then you can make of it what you will and uh, hunt the dogman on your own. And there'll always be things that we miss. So feel free to send us in some information, especially when it's such a thing that Spans so much time. Absolutely. All right. Probably, the, I think the key, the uh, the uh, golden dog. Hmm? What's the thing when it's like the main thing of your thing? You know what I mean? The crux. Golden calf. A sacred cow. The uh, creme de la creme, the, the golden egg, whatever it is. Whatever you put in the middle of something, it's like the, the featured thing. This is the featured the thing. The pin. Sure. There's something more grand. Is it golden for sure? It's like, it's when it's on display. It's, I want to say it's French. The vin de la vin. The creme de la creme. No, I said that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. So the je ne sais quoi, which I guess technically is. Um, robot lady, what am I thinking of? You may be thinking of the crux, the cornerstone, the pièce de résistance, the narrative locus, the crown jewel. Um, thank you. Moving along. This is the <laughs> robot lady. <laughs> this is the main thing. Uh, she's the best paid part of the show. She's a bit of a slave. Um, this is the reason why I decided to revisit the topic and do this episode was because I, I'm so sorry whoever sent this into us and told, corrected us that there was more information out there about the LBL and the, uh, the incident there with, with the werewolf dogman attack, whatever you want to call it. This was the reason that I wanted to revisit this and do this episode was this confession. Again, this comes from the North American Dogman Project, a fascinating documentary that we'll have linked in the show notes. Definitely go to the YouTube channel, 
they went out and interviewed Jan. They interviewed uh, Barton Unley was there and interviewed this guy with his deathbed confession that they call Glenn, who I believe is a pseudonym. Yeah, and Jody Cook, who started the North American Dogman Project and author of a bunch of books. Yeah, thanks to him and everyone else who was there at the time. Go to their channel, give them a like and a subscribe, and uh, also check out Barton Unley's channel because he, I think he just started kind of recently and it's blowing up. He's doing great work. So check it out. Link in the show notes. This comes from that documentary, Land Between the Lakes by NADP. So this first clip, I transcribed Glenn's statement. I used my voice to tell it just because I wanted John to be able to put some sonic atmosphere to it. But these are essentially all his words with some tiny grammar or something just for the flow of me saying it. But watch the original to hear his own words telling this account. And then after that, we're going to hear his own actually clips from his own responses to some of the back and forth Q&A about what was the aftermath from this? Why didn't you report it right away? Why are you reporting it now? What did it look like? You know, some more detail. So we'll hear those clips coming after. But this is the initial event. And again, this took place in the land between the lakes in October of 1979 during an early morning fishing trip. At this point, Glenn, he'd been a Kentucky Fish and Wildlife employee for 20 years. And this occurred during his second year of employment. Essentially, his job was to stock fish in the different lakes in Kentucky. Bass, bluegill, catfish, trout, rainbow trout. But on this particular occasion, it was just one of his regular fishing trips in the LBL. Let's hear it. This all took place in October of 1979. I was on my regular fishing trip at 4.30 in the morning at LBL. As I headed out, there was a nice little fog, beautiful morning out, and I was just enjoying the fishing like I normally do. I decided to head back around 7, 7.30, just took it nice and slow about five mile an hour approaching the land coming up on my port side. And so I was headed that way and I noticed to the right of the campsite there was a dark figure. I couldn't perceive exactly what it was other than the fact that it could have been anything at that point in time. And then it stood up. And the thing about it that shocked me was that when it stood up it was covered with hair. It looked more like a dog and it was standing on two legs. And then the two campers decided to come out. Apparently they heard me go by in the boat at a slow speed. And I kept yelling at them over there. I mean, I was literally screaming at them. Hey! Turn around! And what they were doing is they were just waving back. Both the lady and the man were just waving back. And I'm watching this thing move closer to them. And all of a sudden, it attacked them. And when I say attack them, it attacked them and killed them. It was bad. It was bad from my view even, and I was close enough to the shore that I thought that was it. I couldn't do anything. Hell, I was yelling at the top of my lungs trying to get these people to turn around to see what was coming after them, and I couldn't even get them to notice what was off to their left. This whole thing scared the hell out of me. I mean, it was something that you don't ever want to live through. I, I have a tough time going through it again myself. I had a lot of bad dreams about it, the whole bit, and to this day it scares the hell out of me. And I'm dying of cancer. And the whole thing is, with that, the story needs to get out. And it needs to be done. And it needs to be done correctly. Wow. So that's his initial reporting. Yeah. Of what he saw. Intense. And I tried to use some of the emotion that I heard him use in the original. Obviously, I'm... You know, it it didn't happen to me, so I was doing my best. But listen to his original account, link in the show notes. Now we're going to hear some of his, some of the back and forth about what he saw, what it looked like during the interview from the NADP. So the first clip here is the North American Dogman Project interviewing him for his deposition and asking him after this account, what happened? Why didn't we hear anything about this? Right. The cover-up. You said one reason why you're coming with this story because you were an employee with the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. Absolutely, for 20 years. And this happened your second year of employment. Absolutely, October 1979. And you never told anyone, any of your employers or anything about the story? No, there was no reports whatsoever. I basically got the idea that nobody wanted to hear about it anyway. Now, back in 1979, this phenomenon, was it very well known among the Department of Fish and Wildlife in Kentucky? Did they know about something like this type of creature, animal, in that particular park? 
My honest belief is that yes, they did, and they have covered everything up is what they did. There was no reports filed. There was actually no investigations involved. There was absolutely nothing there that justified two people being basically murdered mm -hmm. in front of me. I mean, there was absolutely no follow through to what I had seen. Weird. Yeah. It definitely sounds sincere. Yeah. Yeah. And again, this is just several months before he does end up passing away from cancer. So, yeah. I mean, you can hear in his voice, he's he seemed pretty darn sincere. Like this occurred. He wants to get off his chest. And again, what does he have to gain? Absolutely nothing, except for some reason, if he wants to have his voice recorded by a yeah, group. Yeah, that's the thing, too, because he's still technically anonymous. No one knows his name. It's it, yeah. The pseudonym is Glenn. This is not for fame, fortune, yada, yada. Right. So the question is, what did it look like? It's obviously something that haunted him for years and years. Yeah, they just got to get off his chest. Yeah, what did it look like? So they go on to ask him, what did it look like? So when you saw this creature, can you describe what, what it looked like? It looked like some type of... Uh combination of a dog and a hyena and a lion because when it first got up it, it, it got into a prowl or an attack mode like a lion would mm -hmm. and then uh it had ears like a dog or a hyena and it sort of had legs like that but it was it was hairy all over the only thing i couldn't see were the feet uh it had human type hands uh it had uh somewhat hairy arms but they're more human looking and then they, it had the pointy ears on the side. That's why I thought it was a dog initially. It just came across to that. But when it got down to prowl and attacked these people, I knew right then and there, hell, I pissed my pants. It, it's, this thing scared the living crap out of me. It was god awful, let's put it that way. Sounds terrifying. <laughs> yeah. And you hear that all the time. You'll hear it in another account coming up. Still want to see one, Jer? Uh, want to is not the right word. Yeah, I was going to say. The answer is no. You don't answer for me. <laughs> it's like one of those things where like, you got to learn by experience sometimes. I don't think that's true. Like the Ouija board, you know, I used to play with that. I didn't used to play with it. I used to, you know. We've used it. Work with it. Work with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we use the Ouija board. Famous last words. When we were younger, when we were kids. And, uh, but if I never did, I don't think that. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the darkness as much. I don't know if this is the best comparison you're making. Uh, I'm not really making a comparison. Uh, my point is just that like, yeah, you can't, yeah. you can't really know what it's like until that happens. So I can, of course I hear stories. Yeah. yeah you can get an idea. Yeah. But... I do not want all the consequences of running into a dogman. I don't want that for my life, but there's all, there's still this part of me, just like this part of me still wants to use the Ouija board. I still want to, I just want to know, I want to see that it's there. I want to know, but of course but you're... I don't want the consequences yeah. from that. And some people survive it relatively, you know, untraumatized, but that's, I think it's rare, but it affects everybody. Yeah. I mean. What people are left untraumatized by it? I mean, I think there's always some level of trauma. Depends on who you believe. Grandpa that said anything worth doing is going to traumatize you in some way. I don't think he said that. What? Okay, I made that up. <laughs> Volunteer work. <laughs> I made that up, but I don't know. I think some some things can have value and be traumatizing. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, this is a very weird way that this conversation is going. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not saying, obviously, people have been severely affected. I don't want to make light of that. And I would say think... That, Anyone that saw the dog man close to it, I'm sure they have, I mean, the nightmares alone. Well, for some people, it's like seeing a demon. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And just like, I feel like you'd never want to go in the woods again. Yeah. I mean, what we're going to be hear afraid to be alone. But you do get this. Some people that have even written into us that say like, you got it all wrong. They're sweet creatures. They're, they're, they're just mammals. They're, they're just, and they're there Who to guide that? and help you. They're, they're guides. Well, some well people, maybe there are the... That's the thing. It could be a different breed. Yeah, like kind of the reptilian thing where some of them are... The feathered serpents? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the angel dogmen. I think if I saw a dog, either way, I just would just kind of avoid that situation because you don't yeah. want to roll the dice with the dogs. You know, I'll, I would see one from a train. <laughs> what about a plane? Or a plane. What if it started running really fast next Maybe year? not a train. Then you're just basically a moving buffet car. <laughs> like, Jeremy, I see you. <laughs> That's probably what I would say in my God brain, too. Ra. There have been uh, some of that mind speak going on with some of these cases. Speaking of the, the God of Ra, we'll touch on that briefly when we talk about the theories at the end with cemetery connections and things like that. But oh, Linda Godfrey's reporting on the, the God of Ra. Well, to wrap up the rest of this deposition here from North American Dog Man Project and the man known as Glenn, let's hear the aftermath. After this all took place, did you turn your boat on and took off? How'd you get out from there? I was in a state of basically numbness. I, I just drifted 
God, I, I lost time on that. I, I just, I drifted for what seems to be hours. Just, just drifted. I was in such a state of shock that uh, I could not function mm -hmm. mentally, physically. I couldn't do anything. It, it, it was that bad. So after this incident happened, you looked in newspapers and things like that to see if there was any type of accidents, murders, or anything like that uh, within like the, the weeks following this Absolutely. incident, and there, nothing showed up in the newspapers or anything. You haven't heard anything from like fellow rangers or anything like that, or anything about that? Absolutely not. Nothing. No knock on the doors, no nothing. It, it just wasn't, uh, it was, I, I guess, filed and shoved up underneath the paperwork. That's all I can figure out. Okay, so there's a classic example of the concept of the cover-up. I can totally see that too. You see something like that on the shore and you're, you're fishing and you see a nightmare fairy tale creature come out and tear apart a group of people. Like you would probably just float yeah. like totally out of it for hours on end. Just in shock. Yeah. So, but he didn't report anything? No, he didn't report at the time. Why not? It sounded, it sounded like his thought was because nothing came out from that well and he said earlier like he had got the impression that no one wanted to hear him i mean wouldn't you think you would be like at least call and be like there was an animal that just <laughs> murdered some people like, well yeah that's a great question and let's hear this last clip because this is probably the most important part it, it explains why he didn't and why he's coming forward now so what was one of the main reasons you felt didn't want to come forward with this story because a lot of people are going to wonder why i mean you've seen something so horrendous you saw people getting killed, and you didn't come and tell authorities. Well, that's, that's, that's the main reason. I didn't want any harm to my family or anything else like that if this was a total cover-up. Yeah, I mean, is that, I, I don't know how that justifies the, the answer, but that's exactly how I felt. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I, I can understand that. And the fact, you know, they would probably think you were in that case coming forward with that anyhow and possibly losing your job. Absolutely. You know? When you work for the State Wildlife Board down in Kentucky, you don't want to bring this to light because, yes, you will lose your job if there's uh, some type of cover-up or some type of situation where they're shoving the center of things so they can keep their customers coming in back mm -hmm. and forth, campers and things like that. If it gets scared away, obviously you know what's going to happen. It's, right. you know, it's going to be your head or, you know, and I, I just, I couldn't afford to put uh, the family through that or anything. So you have, um, you have cancer and uh, apparently the diagnosis don't look good. Doesn't look good, uh, several months max. Uh, it's time to get the story out. So, um, you know, so this is basically your deathbed confession. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I uh, appreciate you coming forward and giving your story. Yeah. I appreciate you listening because yeah. this is the first time we sat down. We uh, we discussed it with some of the members of the family and decided it was time. Rest in peace, Glenn. I mean, yeah, he definitely sounds like he's experienced where he believes he experienced it. He definitely sounds like he believes it. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. The only thing is just weird to me is just like if I saw something like that happen, I would still report like a murder like an anonymous yeah or, or just be like yeah i saw some animal just maul some people right maybe not i don't know it's it is hard to say if you actually saw that yeah yeah how you would respond but i would think that i would at least i don't know yeah no, I, right. I know what you're saying I, it's funny because he didn't say this but what kind of came into my mind was you know the experience that you have when you have like a demonic nightmare and you wake up and you don't want to talk about it because you almost feel like you're going to draw it back in. You don't want to tell anybody about it right away. You've heard that a lot with dogman encounters. Also, alien abduction, same thing. Like where a lot of times people- Yeah, no, I get that. Where it's, you almost feel like you're drawing back in the darkness. He didn't say that. Right. But that did occur to me when he was telling the story. Would it be a situation if I were in that situation? Because I, I feel like I've at least had the nightmares. Maybe not alien abductions. Yeah, but and maybe that's why I didn't say anything at first. The and first then he realized days. that- this wasn't coming out exactly and then, no i mean that that makes sense that's what i thought of but i'm not putting words in his mouth interesting it's it's almost like it's almost like a um, like it was going to come find him or yeah, something exactly it's almost like a psychological infrasound mechanism like the idea that you can be paralyzed by you know a roar from a lion mm -hmm. and you hear that with the dog man too and these sorts of things where you could be frozen Sasquatch. But what if there is a psychological kind of paralytic 
that's attached to just witnessing something like yeah. this or just the energy of this being that keeps you from wanting to talk about it because you just have, you know, people we've, and it's a slightly different topic, but the skinwalker, we covered that report of that guy who encountered one and then it would come visit him in his dreams regularly. Right. And it keeps you from wanting to talk about it from, you know, if you're that traumatized by it, that you don't even want to like believe it happened. Yeah. Maybe he didn't want to believe it for a period of time and then saw that when no one the days following reported it, because obviously someone's going to find it. Just like in the original story, some other campers found it. Yeah. If this was a different incident or the same one, someone came across it and you realize there is no reporting of it. There's no investigation that's publicized, no news. At that point, you'd be scared. Right. You know, not only to lose your job or to sound like a nutcase, but who's going to come after you if they're willing, if they're willing to cover that up? The real world repercussions. Yeah. So, well, props to Jody Cook of North American Dogman Project and Barton Nunley and everybody else involved with that. Yeah. Again, link in the show notes. You guys can watch the original You'll get a little more context for how they vetted this guy. They did check to make sure he was actually working there at the time. All that work was done ahead of time, according to Jody. Yeah. So um, I think it's an important video, uh, believe it or not, but it's, I think it's definitely one of the most important pieces of evidence in the whole dogman phenomena. And we do have even more testimony coming up from a retired sheriff who had an experience in the LBO. Compliments of Tony Merkel of the Confessionals podcast. Yeah. Letting us use that clip. Friend of the show. There's gonna be much more clips that I'm excited to get to, some harrowing accounts. Yeah, you know, dogmen may just be eating fear, you know? If, you think so? I mean, maybe if this account, you know, there's a, maybe it's a different sort of dogman. But humans need real food. That's true. Sometimes you need food that's just ready to go. Exactly. And that's why you need factor. Well, that's why I'm excited to try it. We have yet to try it, but we'll be trying it soon. Yeah, I'm actually really excited about this sponsor. Thank you, Factor, for sponsoring this episode, making it possible. Yes! It does look delicious. It really does. Yeah, I'm super excited because, you know, doing the research for the show and all the work and editing and John doing sound design, we're all super busy. So I'm psyched to try something that is prepared, chef-crafted, ready to eat. Over 35 different options. Yeah, and you don't got to cook it. Yum. Do you have to cook it? Two-minute meals. Ah, so it's pretty much ready to go. Yeah. It's just a quick little heat, and you got your meat. It's cool, too. <laughs> yeah, you did. Wow. It's cool, too, because you've got your options. You know, you've got your keto, you got Calorie Smart, vegan, and veggie. I do like that. Yeah. Some of those other competitors out there don't have the specific diet plans. Yeah. Plus, if you sign up with our code, you get 50% off, which is pretty excellent. Excellent. But yeah, it also sounds cool, like the no prep, no mess part of it. Yeah. You know, the fact that they have 100% ready to heat meals. Mm -hmm. Like you can take those on a trip. Yeah. To be fair, I've tried some other mail-in kind of food programs or whatever, and it's still, a lot of them are still a lot of work. Yeah. And that kind of defeats the purpose for me. So I'm really excited about Factor. Like that really comes out of that. I want healthy food. I want good food. And you want it fast. I want it fast. And I don't want to go to Taco Bell. Get it in me. I, I want to go to Taco Bell, but I want to be better than that. And yeah. I want to try Factor. I don't want to feel like I went to Taco Bell. Yes. So head to factormeals.com slash beliefhole50 and use code beliefhole50 to get 50% off. Yeah. What? That's code beliefhole50 at factormeals.com slash beliefhole50 to get 50% off. Heck yeah. Get that yum. <laughs> Support them because they're supporting us, guys. Yeah, they're going to be a sponsor for a couple more episodes, and we are going to get it in the mail soon. And we'll let you know how it is. We're excited to try it, so you try it too. Heck yeah. Cool. All right. All right, tasty stuff. On that note, I am hungry. You guys want to take a quick snack? Stop at the snack stop. We're going to take a little break, <laughs> and we'll be back with more Munch Munch. After the break, guys, we've got some more harrowing tales and in-depth dives into the fur. The furry fray. Welcome back. We hope you had a nice one because it's about to get fascinating. So strap in. Yeah, that's right. We're back with more corroboration. Yes, more corroboration. This next piece comes from the Confessionals podcast with Tony Merkel, good friend of the show, great guy. In this episode, he interviewed a retired sheriff named Martin Groves, and it's a fascinating account. I went through about an hour and 20 minutes to whittle down two short pieces to try to get to the heart of some of the most intense encounters. But you guys should definitely check out the entire episode. There's so much more detail. He talks about his law enforcement background, what made him uniquely capable in these moments, but also uh, surprisingly still broken in certain moments because of what he witnessed there. 
Yeah, you got to love the corroboration with trained observers, especially ones that aren't anonymous. Yeah. It always adds so much credibility for me. I agree. Um, and I think you can hear in his voice, too, that he is a, a sincere guy and that this really affected him. Um, again, his name is Martin Groves. This took place in 1993. He was camping at the land between the lakes with his hunting partner who, out of respect for his friend who recently passed away, he's kept him anonymous. So he, he calls him Harry in the story. This comes from actually the description of Tony's video. They embarked on what was supposed to be a relaxing weekend hunting trip in this scenic region. However, as nightfall descended, tranquility gave way to tension. Now this first clip, for the sake of time, I sped up his voice a little bit. I had to cut out some detail and context, but again, link in the show notes for the entire interview. So this first clip I titled The Hunt Begins. He's already made camp with his friend Harry, and I think they've gone their separate ways during the day to go hunting. He comes across another guy named Bubba in the uh, land between the lakes there. They kind of become friendly really quickly. They have a lot of things in common. And this other hunter ends up giving just a little word of warning that leaves an unsettling tone for the rest of the evening. It started getting later and later in the afternoon. I knew I needed to get back and he wanted to go back to his camp. And anyway, we exchanged pleasantries, shook hands and was saying goodbye. And as I started to walk off from him, he told me, he said, say, you know, I, I probably shouldn't say anything, but, uh, I just wanted to warn you, you might keep your heads up in the late evenings or at nighttime. He said, this has been something circling my camp at night, but it stays outside the fire light zone. In other words, it would stay far enough from where the lighted area was from his camp that he couldn't see what it was. And I said, I asked him, I said, well, what is it? And he said, I don't know. He said, I'm, I'm here by myself. And I'm not really frightened or anything. I do have a firearm in the truck, but I just thought I'd give you a heads up. And um, so it was real casual, very casual and very laid back. And okay. at the time, I, I should have paid more attention to that. But again, uh, very, I don't want to use the word that comes to my mind, but I was just very too overconfident as a young man and as a young hunter, mm. that, that overconfidence level that you have. Sure. And uh, so I just shrugged it off and we said our goodbyes and he drove off and I went my separate way. And uh, to be honest, I didn't even give it a, a thought whatsoever at the moment. And even on my way back, when I began to notice some things, I still didn't give it any credence. And um, we're walking back, and uh, I'm just kicked back, walking through the woods. I've done give up. It's starting to get almost dark. And as I'm uh, walking through the woods, the first thing that I noticed is just for an evening in land between the lakes, you're going to hear the frogs, and you're going to begin to hear the night insects and the crickets and different things. And I heard nothing. And again, just never gave it any thought. And I'm so confident and I'm headed back to my camp and I just am not paying attention. I'll be honest with you. I'm just not paying attention. And uh, the further that I walked, I began to hear some noises. The first thing that happened was that I heard a extremely strange noise in the woods. Now I'm miles away from any buildings. I'm miles away from any other vehicles. Where this gentleman had pulled up and spoke to me was the end of the road. It did end right there into the woods. And I had watched him drive away, so I knew that he was not anywhere in the area. The first noise I heard was an extremely loud metallic noise that sounded as if it was a heavy metal door scraping the floor and, and closing. And it, it, as soon as the noise happened, it disappeared. I look back now, it should have told me that there was something wrong right then and there. So it becomes even death or quiet. And right after I heard this noise, I'm looking left and right, and I'm looking up in the air to see if this, you know, possibility of an airplane or something had flown over me. I didn't see anything and it was death quiet. And as I'm walking, this is when I began to see something out of my peripheral vision to the parallel to the right of me. And I noticed that there was something running in the woods beside of me, but kept its distance from me. The more I walk, the more that I'm beginning to really pay attention and to watch. I did catch a glimpse at one point and I was convinced at some point that I had a pack of coyotes that was after me. 
And this is not unheard of in land between the lakes. You can see as many as 20 to 25 coyotes in the woods at any time. And this is when they come out. So I still don't have any guard up. Then I begin to hear whistles. Loud, shrill whistles. But I cannot see anything. I can't see anybody. So at some point, my mind is thinking that, okay, do I have a hunter in the woods with me? And these are his hunting dogs. So again, I'm just chucking right along and, and no fear, no thought. But the thing that come to my mind, and I noticed, if they're coyotes, a hunter's dogs, why haven't they moved in on me and got closer to sniff me out or, or to discover what I am? So I'm walking a brisk pace at this point, and I just froze. And when I stopped, these animals stopped. They did not continue. And I knew at that point that something was wrong here. Whatever this was that was running in the woods and keeping a distance away from me, I began to realize that these animals were stalking me and that the fact that the animals were smart and intelligent enough that they would walk when I walked, yet stop when I stopped. That's when I began to get worried. So at some point, I began to see some light where the sun is coming down and it's real late and this is when I see something moving in front of me. And I see a very large shape next to a couple of oak trees. I felt that it was a hunter. And because of what I did for a living, I've used ghillie suits many times. And that's what, in my mind, I'm seeing a hunter in a ghillie suit that is up in front of me. And then so everything's starting to make sense now to me that uh, this hunter is calling his dogs and uh, he probably doesn't like me being in his area. So I just wrote everything off. So I'm looking ahead of me when I hear the metallic noise once more. So I've got whistles, I've got something being hit, struck against something, rock on rock or rock on tree. And then I hear the second strong metallic noise. This noise takes my full attention, but I still am trying to focus at the hunter ahead of me and he just disappears out of my view. And I'm thinking, how did this guy just duck away from me? Did he duck behind the tree or what did he do? So yes, by this point, I'm, I'm very nervous, but I, I don't know what to think. And all these equations are going through my mind, but I know now that I'm losing all my sight from, from the light going away. And I do have something in the woods with me and this is very strange. So I hump it back to camp pretty, pretty fast. Definitely creepy. Yeah. I mean, imagine that. It almost sounds like Bigfoot activity with the whistles and the, the knock. Exactly. What about yeah. the metal? Yeah. But I thought my brain always goes to this, but like, dimensional doorway. Oh, yeah. I mean, of course. I mean, who knows? But I mean, you know, silence. What else would it be? The odds I mean, effect and then that metal scraping door opening a, sound. Like a unique sound in the middle of the woods. That's a sound that they come back to multiple times in the interview. About, oh, really? Yeah. Having heard this. This is not over yet, right? No, there's our second part. Yeah, there's another piece. I mean, there's it's again, it's like a two or two and a half hour episode interview with him, and I had to edit it down to just a couple pieces. So the next the next clip's a little shorter. Again, full episode linked. So at this point, he's hiking and he feels like he's being stalked. The guy or thing in front of him that he thinks is a hunter in a ghillie suit disappears out of view, and uh, these things are pacing him. At which point he freezes. And realizing that these are not coyotes. You, you know, it's normal to see coyotes, but they'll keep running. They'll keep moving around. Right, yeah. They don't stop when you stop. And I've lost raptors. Yeah. And uh, so at this point, he pulls his gun, you know, gets basically prepared for to do what he has to do, just, you know, to be safe. And he starts, you know, booking it back to camp. Meets up with his hunting partner, Harry, who's already at camp. And he can tell by Harry's face that Harry's been experiencing something too. And it's funny, Christy, you say Bigfoot activity because... It almost sounds like what he encountered are two different types of entities. Oh, really? Yeah. That almost... Working together? I wouldn't say working together, <laughs> but he, he does witness two different things. And I have that coming up in the, in the clip coming up. But when he's back at the, the camp, he and Harry, and they're talking, he describes to him how while he was hunting, I think in, in the cornfield or some kind of field, uh, a half-eaten corn cob is chucked at him, whizzes by him. Someone So something with a thumb or, you know, four fingers and a thumb to be able to grab something and chuck it like that. But beyond that, if you're throwing something really light, right, with air friction and everything, you have to be very strong to, to chuck it at any 
intense speed like that at a, at a distance, you know, like a wiffle ball, for instance. Corn cobs are got some got some tremor girth though. Feel like? Well, I'm just you know I'm not a corn cob expert, but yeah, corn. I've thrown corn cobs before. <laughs> yeah, John's hit me with corn cobs before. Yeah. I mean, they they can be like pretty heavy. Yeah, yeah, but compared to like a baseball, and if I don't know. I mean, like if you've got a corn cob here and a baseball here and a wiffle ball here, corn cob is going to be way more on the baseball side than the wiffle ball side. What That's are you talking about? Yeah. In the Venn diagram, you can compare well, it to wiffle ball. Yeah, I would say it's pretty close to the middle. But the point is, like, you could throw. You could, how fast? Well, you I could... used to launch. What one? I'm not going to go too deep into the story. <laughs> deep, Seven miles deep. an hour. I was in a cornfield once, and uh-huh. we had a coach. We were like in the middle of a cornfield mm-hmm. playing. There was a soccer field and the coach had this old beat up car and we basically, he let us just beat the crap out of it with corn cobs. Like we <laughs> were just launching them uh-huh. and it would ju- it just broke all the windows. What? And, yeah. You broke a window with a corn cob. I mean, it didn't like sh- shatter, but it definitely like cracked the window. Really? Yeah. Huh, I find that hard to believe. I love that we have real world experience with John throwing corn cobs. <laughs> I'm just like, saying, what are the they're, they're not. No, but I'm talking about like a, a big husk. I'm talking about like half eaten... Dry, yeah. dried up corn cob. You you cracked a window with a. Well, half, they weren't half eaten, dried up. They were like heavy. A, they dense. were corn. Okay. They were like it was a corn cob. Well, this is Move just, on to your next piece of evidence, Jeremy. Okay. Well, my point <laughs> is throwing that out of court. Well, and that at the time, even though this, I don't know how relevant this is to the story. One of the points that Harry made was that the speed at which this fairly light object compared to like a heavy thing, when something being thrown from so far where he can't see where the person is, and it, the speed at which it went. Oh, that was just kind of his argument that it had to be, but beyond that, someone thing with thumbs. If it was a dried up corn, that would be different. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's kind of what I envisioned when he said it. But you guys check the original interview because the whole thing's there. But this is an important part of the story. At the same time, of course, they're thinking like, okay, this is with the whistling and uh, things being thrown. Lots of weird stuff going on. Yeah. And you and in this area too, in Land Between Lakes, there's a lot of old foundations, buildings again that were torn down and burned during reclamation uh, for the new park back in the 60s. And you have these old walls, different structures there, and they end up camping thinking that they're going to be protected. Early on, they, they pick their camping place because they, they want to be protected from the elements. Maybe any critters running around, they have some protection with this old stone wall, which apparently turned to be, out to be a terrible mistake because along with the corn cobs that Harry experienced, then they start getting giant stones, like 30, 50 pound stones oh, wow. heaved at them. So Sounds like Bigfoot. Yeah. Whatever this thing is, is strong. But still, in their mind, like, what this has to be human, right? It's, that's what they're thinking. Like, I don't know how to explain this, but it's human and, or most likely. You had a cop and a fireman out there, probably kind of skeptical. Well, they're both cops. Yeah. Harry, I just didn't say earlier, Harry was his partner. Oh, I'm sorry. On the job. And so, like, they have immense respect for each other. They know each other. that They can handle any situation together. They've been doing it for, you know, years and years on the job. Uh, and that's a very important part of the story I should have mentioned earlier. Um, not just a hunting partner. Anyways, so they're at the campsite. And he's telling him what, what's happened to him. At some point, they see these red lights on the other side of a tree. And they're thinking, okay, I'm used to seeing guys at night, uh, some guys encroaching on our campground, which you don't do, uh, thinking these are the cherries of two cigarettes on either side uh, of this oak tree. I know where this is going. His police training kicks in. First thing you do, you know, yell out, Sheriff's Department, uh, come out, expose yourself. What are you doing here kind of thing? Expose yourself. <laughs> that's, I think that's the word he used. Get naked. <laughs> I don't think of a better way to put that, but I think that's how he said it. He exposes himself at some point, but it is not human. So let's play this next clip of the actual encounter at the campsite. The noises are beginning to get louder, but above us, we have a rock that got hurled and we could actually hear the rock coming towards us. It comes off the top of the ridge. It just hits and it thumps right in front of us. And it is a massive rock. I've estimated a 30 to a 50 pound rock. They just blew me away and I'm like, honestly, it's like they're trying to kill us. And when it hits the ground, you felt it. I look at Harry, he looks at me and he, by this point he, he's screaming, you know, what the heck? Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, again, we're men, so we're not, we're not using our manners and we're, we're screaming, we're, we're saying a few choice words. That, and this is the part when it gets really hard for me to talk about, but that that is when we had a noise come in by those oak trees that was just, Tony, it was hideous, and it was a growl. And it was a growl, and it was so intense that it rattled the inside of my chest cavity. I've heard bear growls. Uh, That's not what this was. 
and it was so intense that it it did something to me and I could tell that it was affecting my friend and it rattled the inside of my body and I began to notice that it caused my heart to speed up but it was an uncomfortable feeling that I cannot describe and I began to feel nauseous I began to feel uh, very sick to my stomach and then it was almost like I couldn't hear the growl but I could still feel it inside of me It was terrifying. That's when I felt like I was frozen, that I could not move. I could not move my legs. I couldn't turn around. I could see Harry beside of me, and he was in the same shape. When I looked at my friend, I could tell that he was slumped in his shoulders and was kind of looking straight down. That's when I heard something come in on the trail beside of us. I could hear the steps. To be honest, I felt something coming. It was a feeling that that I cannot describe, and it felt like, hey, something is coming. And in the fire glow of the camp, I could see movement, and I'm catching something walking in, and it is bipedal. Is this beast? Is this man? I don't know what that it is. And as it begins to get closer, I see a bipedal, canid-type, wolf-like beast. Two legs and it's walking towards me. I can't move, I can't use my legs, I can't use my arms, almost can't breathe. It has sped my my rate of breathing up like I had run a race. And this thing's getting closer to me. And as it gets closer to me, I notice the ears on it are erect and they're, they're like pointed towards me and it's staying outside the glow of the fire, but it's getting closer and backing away, coming back, going back and forth, and then it walks in. And as it walks in, I can see this thing sniffing the air. It's almost as if it's sniffing me. And I look back now, I wonder if it was trying to sniff fear. And then it grins at me. This thing exposes its teeth. And by this point, it comes in close enough within 15 to 25 yards. And I'm seeing something that should not exist. This thing does not exist on this earth. And is it a man in a costume? Is it is this a hoax being played? Is it a joke? All these things going through my mind. But you got to also understand what is affecting my body. There's something uh, not right with my body. Can't move. Can't do anything. And this thing's getting closer. The only thing I could think of. The only thing I could think of at the time was my religious upbringing. I'm thinking, whatever this is, it's going to take me out. It's going to eat me or kill me. And I began to pray, and I began to pray. And I I prayed the shepherd's prayer, David's prayer, the Psalm 23rd. And I began to pray. And when I began to pray, I just felt like I was regaining my mind back. But I could see this thing, and it was not moving closer. But this thing staring at me, I'm staring at it, and I'm saying the prayer. And then I began to verbally pray. And I, you know, I began to pray hard and louder and louder. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not fear. By God's grace, I felt stronger. If it eats me, it eats me or whatever. But I'm beginning to gain what I felt at the time. I began to feel strength. I don't know if it was my hands or my leg that moved first, but I moved. I no longer was like a child that was so afraid to get out of its bed to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I felt stronger. And at some point, my senses come to me, my training kicked in, and I retrieved my firearm with my right hand. And I had on my possession, it actually was my department-issued weapon at the time, and I pulled my firearm, and I pointed it at this creature. And when I did, the creature moved backwards. This beast, this... This demon, whatever I was seeing that should not exist, it moved. And that told me that this animal was intelligent. It moved backwards. You have to understand that we are trained, and we know, and I mean in a millisecond, in a millisecond you've got to make decisions. When you let off a round and it leaves the end of your weapon, you've got to know where that where that round is going to. You've got to know what your target is. You've got to know, is that a man? Is it an animal? And I was real hesitant to pull that trigger. I just couldn't fathom that this was anything but a man because it looked so much like a man. And I couldn't pull the trigger. 
and I lowered my gun. And when I lowered my gun, this creature advanced on me and started walking towards me. And I felt, I felt at that point, it's a given. It's paid for. It's still approaching me. I'm trained to protect myself. I've got someone behind me I've got to take care of too. All these things are going through my mind. I fired twice. I raised my firearm and I just charged two rounds. Tac, tac. Almost sound like one. At the same time I shoot, simultaneously, whether if it was a sympathetic reaction or what, the man behind me, Harry, discharges his double barrel shotgun. So I fired two rounds, he's fired two rounds, but when I fire my two rounds, poof. The creature that was in front of me, I don't know where it went. I heard noises going up the wall, but I didn't see it. It was almost as if this thing just dissipated. Yet I heard noises going up the wall. I, to this day, I don't know what happened and where it went to. But behind me, when my partner discharges his shotgun and he fires two times, I hear a squall, I hear a scream. So behind me, I've turned around at this point. I'm still trying to cover from that angle. I'm hearing something above us again. I'm hearing the, the screams or squall of something that sounds like a cross between a pig and some hideous animal. We've got a solid cane break that is behind these trees that runs along the creek. And I'm seeing the cane, just there's something going crazy in the cane. I also hear my partner running. <laughs> At this point, he snatched up some stuff that was in the camp, and he's left me. Jeez. Oh, sorry, Martin. <laughs> You're on your own. Heavy. At the camp. Man, that's intense. Yeah. That is a freaky, freaky story. And that's just the beginning. I mean, so many questions there. That's just the beginning? Yeah. It goes on from there. You know, we only have so much time in this episode. Yeah. We might play some clips in the expansion as well, um, but we'll have the full episode yeah, link to definitely check it out. Definitely should play some more in the expansion. We, we can do that. That's definitely one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. Yeah, it gets crazier. Like his friend, Harry, as the pseudonym goes, uh, gets in the truck, is, you know, instant reaction to just get out of there. He's basically like, you're not leaving me here. You know, runs, he jumps onto the back of the pickup truck just in time. What? As Harry starts barreling away. And then these things, obviously, this is not where the story ends. Yeah. Well, have that in the expansion for sure. We'll play a clip in the expansion so you guys want to hear more of us kind of going over that stuff, but definitely check out the original, the full thing from Tony. Yeah, thank it you, Tony. It definitely sounds like demonic, uh, supernatural yeah. creature and there's, some sort. That's the thing is there's more than one. There is the, the canid thing that he sees. And the thing I didn't mention, or that I started to mention earlier about the cigarette cherries they thought they were seeing in the trees initially, that's when they realized those were eyes. Yeah. Well, I figured that. Yeah. And there were two, two creatures that time, but... This thing that scampered up over the wall, this werewolf-like creature, it sounds like it's different than what, uh, what Harry... Wall? So I said earlier there was like a stone wall that they... Okay, a stone wall. They had camped behind, yeah. So this thing, after he shoots at it, disappears. It sounds like he went, scampered up this, this tall stone wall behind their campground. Okay. Uh, and that's where he might have gone, but he didn't see it. He said it pretty much evaporated. It moved so quickly. But he kind of heard the sound up the wall. You don't outrun a bullet, though. No, it's more like he got hit, or once they realized that they, they had weapons, he ran away. It's not like he ri dodged the bullet. I know, but the way they made it sound like it, it just was gone in an instant. Like, it had beyond just regular animal ability to move. Right. It's the way they made it sound. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely, yeah, the way it, like, poof. Yeah. And the fact that it knew to, like, back away That was a cool gun. part, that, like, he, that's when he realized this thing is intelligent. Yeah. It's not just a wolf on two legs or something, but the shotgun blast that Harry gave off to the thing in the field, right? And you heard that scream. I believe in the story, and we'll hear maybe in the, in the expansion then, and Tony's original, you can find that in the show notes. Bigfoot. Ugly, hideous, evil-looking, freaky, disturbing mutation of a what you'd think of a Bigfoot is. Megafoot. You've, we've told stories about the red-eyed, evil-looking Bigfoot in the desert, you yeah. know, the Sonora and everything, the Mojave. These things that they come across are like, I don't know if he sees the dogman entity first or the Bigfoot. Honestly, I can't remember. It was kind of confusing the way because they were interrupted in the interview with uh, some technical issues. But he also sees this thing and he describes it saying like, you know, this was not Patty waving back to you from like the Gimlin footage. This thing was like pure hate and demonic, it seemed like. Anyway, so that's more of the story. But again, another creepy visual is the dog or whatever it is sniffing in the air. Yeah. That's so cinematic. Fear sniffers. 
like it just kind of comes into the light. It's like, yeah, like sniffing. It, that's a really disturbing thought too. Like I that was it sniffing for me, but looking back on it, it's a sniffing fear. It's like straight out of a movie. Yeah. Like I can, I totally visualize the whole scene. Just yeah. being in Kentucky, you know, it's similar to Tennessee, isn't it? Yeah, it's right on the border. That's, yeah. So I mean, this, Tennessee, like when I drove through it a lot to get to Austin. Yeah. I mean, there's just some wild forests out there. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Very beautiful. It's totally enchanting and magical. I can just imagine being deep in that yeah. country and just red eyes. This area land between the lakes is in Tennessee and uh, Kentucky. Oh, okay. Kentucky. It spans the border. Very enchanting yeah. place. I love that area. Oh, I was going to say, what do you think the chances are, off the wall survey of you two, that this is not biological and it's not a spiritual uh, or uh, interdimensional, what are, the, what are the chances that these things that people see are, let me finish the statement before you cut me off with that's ridiculous. <laughs> what do you think the chances are that they are a secret military operation <laughs> using high technology and fear tactics and psyops to create strange experiments in remote areas of the wilderness? Oh, come on. I don't know. I think that's possible. Could be possible, right? I think it's the truth. Do you? I definitely think that's possible. I guess it's pl yeah, possible. I mean, I think that you know, we've, you hear psyops all the time. We've had, we have a history. I know history the experiment of with animal crossover and stuff like that. What if yeah. they just got loose from the lab? <laughs> Hybrids. I even mean like psychologically, like or for example. That would explain oh. some of the more paranormal aspects of it. Right. Mm. And even invisibility tech. I'm not saying, I wouldn't lean towards that as the plausible explanation, but I just want to throw out there for fun. Yeah. Because anything is open in the belief hole, I feel like. Oh, so you're, th you're saying maybe even an experiment on the witnesses. Yes. So maybe when... Maybe when Martin met Bubba, right? Yeah. On the on the, the old logging road before he went to his campground, maybe when they shook hands and said their goodbyes, maybe he had a, one of those little uh, CIA patches that have like the condensed liquid or whatever that can absorb into your skin and then start to make you hallucinate. Yeah. Or and so maybe if whatever technology or things are out there, it could have been even exaggerated. I mean, I'm not saying <clears> which I'm not saying that's obvious. Right, right. But I but I did when I hear the story, it just especially with the container sound of the, the metal scraping sound, I couldn't oh, yeah. help couldn't help but think of dog soldiers. Oh, when yeah. they're like these secret military, military experiments that, that actually, escapes. That's interesting. Like somewhere opening yeah. a gate to let the dog men out and you just yeah. Yeah. like a an underground base exactly. sort of thing. Like Cabin in the Woods. Yeah. Just opens up. Whatever it was, I mean that is something I don't even know why anyone would go look for this thing after hearing a story like that. Yeah. This is not a friendly Bigfoot. Yeah. I mean, I, I would rather it be a military operation, obviously, than demons visiting our I realm. I don't know. You know? I would, yeah, me too. But you could also, like, if his, if the solution that often works that seems to have some kind of faith or spiritual willpower can fight off a demon, oh, right. but that's not going to stop, you know, a soldier the guy from Stranger Things in the suit. It's true. Know, yeah. Cutting you up for Either science. way, you're in trouble. So maybe yeah. bring a friend. Yeah, when super you're, intense. Bring a buddy when you go camping and um, a lot of weaponry and lights i look forward to more of that in the expansion yes and again for the full original which we won't be covering all of it the full original definitely check tony's show yeah thanks to tony yeah for letting us use those clips also in the expansion since we're i think we're running out of time here but um i'll touch on some of the possible theories when it comes to stuff we've talked about before which i think is fascinating which is the spiritual architecture the the boundary stuff with the water yeah. there the, the landscape there the features there so interesting. we didn't really talk about that the when the land between the lakes with the 270 some cemeteries that are now kind of orphaned yeah. there and so many of them are maybe underwater there's great ghost stories in the region and there's this this connection that i wanted to mention earlier but you know we've, we've covered in other episodes but the connection with the dogman and graveyards cemeteries almost yeah. acting as a guardian of these kind of sacred places we had the early account with um god Ra, linda yeah. godfrey uh, and the connection of that early sighting there in the, the what, catholic church or early 1900s or monastery i forget what it was school for the um, special te specialty children <laughs> special needs children or something anyways <laughs> there's a yeah a lot of interesting lore with this guys we're gonna have to touch on this again in the future and check out and our, the expansion and in the expansion we'll be getting into a lot of this too it's more kentucky lore and some more of the account from uh, martin and others and what they witnessed so yeah and we're actually going to touch on spiritual architecture and barricading the boogeyman which we covered in season two, which is one of my favorite topics. And I, eventually we're going to do like a whole nother deep dive on it. But basically we're going to be retouching on the concepts of water and its relationship to cultures around the world and the use of not only water, but other natural elements to create boundaries to keep spirits at bay, which relates to this episode when it comes to the geographical aspects of the land between the lakes. Yeah. Isolate that spook scum. Sure. We'll be touching on that as well as many other fascinating things. So make sure to check it out. In the expansion, right? Yeah. 
And for those of you who don't know, every episode we drop an expansion episode, which is really just another full episode for members. So if you want to hear more of this specific topic or over a hundred other episodes that we have there of, of deep dives, a lot of intrigue and a lot of fun in a lot of the episodes, come on over to believeful.com. We also have the archive first season. Yes. Which is 30 so episodes of us getting our feet wet. Being dangerous. A lot of, a lot of fun times that <laughs> yeah. we had. Uncensored. Uncensored, a little bit more raw off the cuff, but yeah, a lot of people like those early episodes. Also yeah. some deeper dives on those episodes because we didn't have time limits back then. So some of them are three hours long with winding trails of research and right. 36 beers. Crazy stuff. Yeah. If you like uh, Colin Quinn's The Green Room, no, it, uh, Tough Crowd, <laughs> or uh, some of those classic like... It just has that vibe of definitely like off the wall. Yeah. A great example of that is our very first Dogman episode is in that archive season and it's called Dogman something werewolves and Beyonce sex magic. So you get the idea <laughs> of sort of topics we covered in the main in yeah. the first season. But yeah, check us out over there. So go to believeful.com, click on the big red expansion button and sign up to get uh, the wonder. Yes. And if you sign up, it's other special tiers to support the show because you're awesome. You get special bonuses as well, like uh, getting your name shouted out on the show. Yep. And actually, we have a special, special person. We do. We do. We have a stinger. Yeah, bringing him back. This is for a special, Shay Olson. Shay. What a sweetie. She is having a birthday coming up. She is. And shout out to her husband, Patrick, who made an effort to get a stinger from the hole. Yes. So we got a song for her, and I got a little fun story to talk about after uh, we get back from the song. So happy birthday, Shay. Happy yeah. birthday, Shay. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Patrick, for reaching out to us and being awesome. Time for the song. And then we'll we'll finish up with a little inside joke at the end of the song. <laughs> Great. <laughs> like describe it. <laughs> huh? And then we're gonna all laugh. I like the tease. Have a good time. Well, it's not gonna make sense mm. until Oh, the song I see your yeah. Let's hear it. This is this is such a hard left turn. <laughs> from the, the, dog the vibe of the song is such a hard left turn from where we came from. Let's call it a palate cleanser. Yeah. yeah. Shay, so how was your day? <laughs> I heard it's your birthday soon. Aww. From Patrick, who loves you, puts no one above you. Shay <laughs> was married in a glacier cave. That's cool. <laughs> She's just a gem, a perfectly ten who dislikes Star Wars. Aww. Her Christmas. <laughs> Who doesn't like Star Wars? Right? I don't like Star Wars, Shay. I dislike Star Wars as well. You're in good company. Shay loves vegetables and Gordon Ramsay a lot. Fuck you! She's a grandma <laughs> at 39, but she's still smoking hot. And when you oh. question her, about her subway tattoo, she'll say she'll always love sandwiches. Subway? <laughs> and when she's bored and has nothing to do, she'll play Dungeons and Dragons. Her stepkids are proud of her because of her success. She's living up to all the hype that Patrick has expressed. Yes. And one more thing that I will say that I don't. <laughs> on the piano roll. Earth, Rick Abney. Oh, Rick Abney. Think she's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I get the throwback there. That's awesome. That's great, John. Good job. But old Star Wars is cool. Star Trek's better. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. It did sound kind of like a love song, which is not weird. Yeah, I, it was very emotional. I didn't know how to feel there. <laughs> was it didn't, you know, like when I do the songs, they just kind of take on a life of their own. Yeah. Like the melody, and I can't really just... You're moved by the divine. It was like, if it was, like it was the first dance at a wedding, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was for a significant other. That's true. So. That's yeah. a good point. From um, Patrick. But Rick Abney, they yes. have an inside joke. This is great. Rick Abney was a stinger a long time ago. And the song was like the best man in the world or something. Oh, yeah. yeah. Best man in the and world. And so they have like a Chuck Norris thing where like they always relate it back well, to... Well, Rick Abney could do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I threw that in at the end there. No, that's great. That's good. Great work, John. Yeah. So happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday, Shay. Thank you for listening. Yes. And thank you, Patrick, for being awesome. Yes. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. I hope that you learned some stuff and that you were given some new information. You might have known some of it before. What do you guys think? Yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for um, joining us today in this exploration. Absolutely. Check out links to all the people in the show notes, like North American Dogman Project, Tony Merkel of the Confessionals Podcast, our friend Heidi with the Macabre Podcast, and uh, Barton Nunley, who's done tons of work too. We're recommending all those people. You check them out. We'll have links in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here, for being freaking awesome. Yes! And for digging deeper in the hole. Yes. And uh, for those of you who are cherished by us and who cherish us, we will see you in the expansion. All right, guys. Until next time. Amen. <laughs> we'll see you on the Louis phone. <laughs> so much excitement. I don't like it. I know. We established Everybody it. knows. You just got to choose to do it or not. How about you guys just do it together? That's fine. We'll, but then we'll, they'll hear you because Chris we're, so we're going to clone you. <laughs> just drop it in. We'll clone you. In. Well, I said the last time you said, that's lame if you drop it in. I don't like cheers. You said that last time. I'm going to say it every time. Just so you guys <laughs> out there know, we are now saying goodbye. And this is Chris and I's real life voice. And also we're taking John from the past and you will enjoy his previous voice. You ready? We'll see you next America's time. America's number one <laughs> meal kit. Goodbye. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. On... on. Believe hole. hole. He did it. That was real. <laughs>